Ladies and gentlemen, welcome here to the library reading room at the heart of the European Parliament complex. Uh, this is part of the uh, European Parliamentary Research Service. Uh, I'm Anthony Teasdale. I'm the Director General of the Research Service, which we put together just under two years ago in order to provide um, more uh, research and think tank type support for members and committees in the European Parliament. Uh, we have uh, three divisions. One is our library, which you're obviously in, but not only uh, is it a library, it also deals with the historical archives of the European Parliament, freedom of information requests, citizens' inquiries, uh, and so on. Uh, a second part is our impact assessment and European added value team, which analyzes how legislation is born and how, once it's been enacted, uh, it applies in practice. And a third part of this is our members' research service, which uh, was a completely new uh, invention and which mirrors uh, what the uh, research service in the Bundestag or in the House of Commons or the Congressional Research Service do, which is provide support to individual members uh, of an analytical kind. We answer the better part of about 3,000 such requ research requests per year. And we also generate a lot of publications. We've just had our 1,000th publication in the course of the last couple of years. Today, uh, here, this is part of uh, not only uh, a kind of outreach strategy, which the EPRS has put in place, but an attempt really to promote the library reading room as a center for intellectual reflection and debate on big issues. And we're delighted that um, not only has uh, ALIA, the European Federation of Academies of Sciences and Humanities, but also in, uh, in its sort of wind-up phase, the European Science Foundation, chosen to work with us in the European Parliamentary Research Service to have such uh, a kind of discussion. Uh, we had a very, very good seminar here uh, about six months ago on demography uh, in Europe, and today we follow that up with an equally uh, interesting and arresting and very topical subject, rather more fast-moving than the slow movement of demography, although they are linked uh, inequality and inequalities in Europe, something which here in the European Parliament people, as you can imagine, debate and are exercised by very closely. Now, it's not my job to chair this event. Um, that falls to uh, Professor Sir Roderick uh, Flood, who, in fact, I know uh, from Oxford University. We were uh, together, I think, at the same uh, college at one stage. Uh, he will be um, moderating a, a round table discussion, if you can describe this as a round, perhaps more um, uh, a rectangular discussion with one part of the rectangle missing. I don't know. It's certainly not entirely in the round, but this discussion here with uh, an audience uh, here from the European <coughs> Parliament. But before that starts, and uh, he introduces the various speakers, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Gunter Stock, president of the uh, ALIA process, to say a few words by means of introduction. So, Thank you. Gunter. Mr. Tisdale, Sir Roderick, dear members of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, members of the roundtable discussion, welcome to this debate on inequalities in Europe, and I'm very pleased and honored just to make a few remarks in the name of the European Federation of Academies of Sciences and Humanities, ALEA. Firstly, I would like to say that we are very grateful again to the European Parliamentary Research Service, and especially Anthony Teasdale, who has already welcomed us for the opportunity to have a discussion with you here in Brussels on an issue which is exceptionally cross-cutting and affects millions of citizens in a myriad of different ways. Secondly, I would like to thank the European Science Foundation for its kind support in facilitating this meeting and for the excellent cooperation during the preparations. And third, from within the ALEA network, I'm more than pleased to mention that with the British Academy, we could again, as many times before, count on a prominent and proactive lead academy for making this event possible. As some of you will know, Tonight's roundtable is a continuation of the successful launch event on mastering demographic change in Europe held in March this year. And as we did last time, we expect the roundtable format to allow for multifaceted views on the various aspects of this topic, including income and wealth inequalities, employment inequality, social policy, as well as other possible related themes such as health, regional, 
educational, democratic, environmental, and gender inequalities. And as with the challenge of demographic change, we also aim for this event on equalities to illuminate, in particular, the value of humanities and social science research on pressing issues that the European Union currently faces. Too often, problems are viewed by policymakers as ones that can be resolved by technical or technological quick fixes, whilst neglecting the importance of behavioral, economic, and social change, which, in certain instances, can take a very long time. We therefore appreciate that inequalities are represented in many of Horizon's 2020 societal challenges, for example, the work program 1617 under the dedicated call Reversing Inequalities and Promoting Fairness, and that to reverse inequalities was named a priority for the EU and the European Council strategic agenda for the Union in times of change. With this round table, we hope to make a contribution from the scientific community and explore and showcase from multiple perspectives the various challenges that the term inequalities comprises. And hopefully, we can point out ways that the policymakers can address these challenges. Like demographic change, the study of inequalities cannot be confined to a few or to one disciplines only. From the short list of different types of inequalities I mentioned a few moments ago, it is clear that a wide spectrum of research and many different types of researchers are required in order to effectively tackle an issue like inequalities, which has the power to infiltrate every aspect of society. Now, it is clear that academies have a special way of handling these issues and with a new mechanism for political advice in SAM, we hope that this strength of interdisciplinarity can add to the quality of scientific advice in, in Brussels and beyond. <clears throat> with these general remarks, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to hand over the floor to tonight's moderator, Professor Sir Roderick Flaut, who in, 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 and, and he will then introduce in a short moment probably our expert speakers, to whom I'm very grateful that they could make it this evening. As we heard, Sir Roderick is chairman of the Scientific Review Group for the Social Sciences at the European Science Foundation, member of our sister academy, the British Academy, and he's the right person to take over not, the not easy task of moderating a discussion on such a multifaceted and challenging issue. Thank you for coming again. Sir Roderick, the table is yours. Thank you very much, Gunther. And may I begin by adding my thanks to Anthony Teasdale and his colleagues for the co collaboration and cooperation that they've demonstrated in uh, mounting this and the, the seminar on demography, which unfortunately, very unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend. But I know how successful it was, and I hope this one will be equally successful. I'm sure it will be. Um, so thanks to Alia, thanks to uh, the European Parliamentary Research Service, and thanks also in a rather valedictory spirit to the European Science Foundation, which has provided the, some of the funds for this event. This is one of the last events of the social science programs of the European Science Foundation, and we very much hope that some of the work that's been done will feed into discussion this evening. Um, when we were discussing the possibility of um, having seminars of this kind, um, uh, we felt that demography and inequality were two of the absolutely fundamental questions that needed to be exposed. Uh, they have, of course, been uh, discussed a great deal, but I think all of us um, feel that much more discussion uh, is needed and much more it, 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 that, that it's very important to bring to public attention the nature and course of inequality and demographic change in Europe and more widely throughout the world. My own scientific discipline is that of economic history, and therefore um, I'm very conscious that the topic of inequality has um, a very, very long history. 
that discussions of um, uh, inequality in its various forms uh, in Europe can be dated back at least to the beginning of the 19th century, if not earlier. And that uh, economic and social historians have analyzed uh, the trends in inequality from a variety of perspectives. Um, I suppose I've made one contribution myself, which was an analysis of the heights of different social groups in British society uh, in the period since um, the middle of the 18th century, which produced, I thought, some quite striking findings, such as the fact that in the early 19th century, if you compare uh, the sons, the young men from the aristocracy of Britain with people from the lowest reaches of society, from the London slums, you will find that every British upper-class boy was taller than any, that, that, than every, um, sorry, than every person from the London slums. The British aristocracy could literally look down on the lower classes in the early 19th century. And that, um, less obviously, is still true today. The upper classes in European societies are taller than the middle classes who are taller than the working classes. And that inequality, which is, arises from uh, a situation at and around birth, persists through life and is heavily correlated with expectation of life. So inequality is physically around us the whole time. Um, and as economic historians have analyzed uh, the development of inequality, um, very much influenced by the work of Simon Kuznets in the United States, they essentially believed that inequality would increase, um, equality would decrease during the period of industrialization in the 19th century, but that then it would begin to diminish. What I think economic historians, and perhaps nobody else realized, is what has been happening in developed societies in the past decades, which is a further increase in inequality. And the analysis of that, and therefore of the long-term historical movement which has made that happen, is something that I hope we can talk about uh, in the course of the next few uh, minutes. So, just to give, that's just to give a very long perspective, but now let's turn to the present. Um, and I'm very delighted to introduce Professor Brian Nolan, who is going to begin. Um, and I've told him that I'd like him to speak for not more than 10 minutes, so I'll hold him to that. And then uh, Andrei Stuschlik, who will then take over with a similar uh, request to speak for 10 minutes. Brian is from the University of Oxford. Uh, professor of Social Policy, and I will leave him to make his remarks and also introduce himself and his work uh, as we go along. So over to you, Brian. Well, thank you very much indeed for the introduction and the invitation to participate. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I won't uh, bore you by uh, giving you the details of my CV. Uh, instead, I will move straight to um, what I take to be my role here, which is to make some brief remarks intended to stimulate um, the subsequent discussion, and uh, that, that includes being a little provocative. So uh, if I don't provoke responses from the audience, I have every expectation that I'll provoke responses from colleagues around the, the, uh, the, 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 the table here. And if I don't, I'll regard that as a, as a real failure. So as the title of our, of our session, Inequalities in Europe, suggests, there are multiple inequalities, some of which uh, Gunter referred to in his uh, opening remarks. I'm, I'm going to narrow the canvas slightly and confine what I say to inequality in income and in wealth. Uh, that, that's a broad enough canvas, as I'm sure you'll agree. And I want to say something about our understanding of trends in inequality in wealth 
and the role of the social sciences in, in both deepening that understanding and in coming up with um, concrete approaches to tackling growing inequality. So we've seen a remarkable upsurge, as has already been said, in interest in, the, in, in this sort of inequality uh, in, in recent years. And that partly reflects what's happening on the ground to electorates, to, to workers, to voters, percolating through to politicians and policymakers. But it very clearly also reflects the fruits of intensive data gathering uh, and research based on new data, without which we wouldn't really know what, what's going on in the first place. Maybe the best illustration of, of this is the uh, attention that is now paid to what's happening at the very top of the income distribution, the top 1%, and we hear all the time about the top 1% versus the 99%. We wouldn't be having that conversation without the painstaking work done by uh, people like Thomas Piketty, Tony Atkinson, and their collaborators, too, too many to mention, uh, in which I played a, a, a mo very modest role myself, um, to come up with and apply new methods of estimating what's been happening to the share of income going to the very top of the distribution, which until, until this uh, program of research, we really didn't, we, we, we were not able to capture. So we didn't know it was happening. Second point I want to make is that it's, it's, I think, all too tempting to simplify the complexity of what we see in the imperfect data that we have into what you might think of as a common grand narrative of inexorably rising inequality accompanied by stagnating living standards and incomes for the bulk of the distribution. Comparative research on trends in inequality at the top and more broadly actually brings out the variety of experiences across the countries of the EU or the OECD. So while the most common and worrying trend has certainly been for inequality to increase, some countries have managed to avoid that. Inequality has increased in income very much more in some countries than in others. And sometimes this is confined to relatively short periods and can be related more or less easily to specific shifts in institutions and policies. Data on wealth is more limited, but thankfully, and, and with a lot of effort, improving very, very significantly. Uh, and this tends to show a rather similar picture of, as, as was said, over the, over the last number of decades, a, a change from a pattern of declining inequality to one of increasing inequality. But again, I'd emphasize with significant variation across countries. So in this, as in, as in other areas, our thinking tends to be particularly influenced by what's happening across the pond in, in the US. Not least because this plays a, a, a remarkably strong part in influencing, influencing the research agenda of the social sciences, but particularly of economics as a, as a discipline. So I'd want to emphasize that the US is an outlier in many respects in the extent of the increases in income concentration at the top and in how long this has been accompanied by stagnating living standards for the middle and lower parts of the distribution. So I think it's, it's, it's easy but hazardous to generalize and draw direct lessons from that US experience. So that highlights the importance of in-depth comparative research on the drivers of inequality in European countries and of the impacts both economic and social, of what we see when we seek to understand trends in, from country to country across the Union. And that's the sort of research that has been um, uh, very importantly supported by uh, various uh, programs of the Union. And it, I would simply want to say that it is invaluable because without it, we will look across the Atlantic and draw the wrong lessons, both about what is actually happening to inequality in our societies and what we should do about it. And just to focus then on that, rather than an inexorable tide, if you like, of inequality washing over the advanced countries, the rich countries, there are feasible and promising policy responses with ample scope for countries to learn from each other in that regard. We, we see 
quite a lot of uh, focus now on the notion that inequality is, is itself now a significant barrier to economic growth with the implication that tackling it can be done via what you might think of as win-win policies, which will benefit everyone, including those, some would argue, right at the top of the distribution. It seems to me that there are real dangers in overselling this message or perspective. Policies like investing in education, uh, upskilling, facilitating women's employment, reducing gender pay gaps, um, promoting quality jobs, active social spending or social investment, if you like, is of course a central focus in this context. Uh, but we know that the distinction between passive and active measures isn't always clear cut, and selective activation policies have to protect the livelihood of those who lose their jobs. Spending now for benefits that in terms of growth may take quite a while to come through involves either raising extra revenue or shifting priorities now and thus hard choices. Finally, if, if our aim is indeed not just to slow down or stop but reverse trends towards increasing inequality in income and wealth, I think one has to seriously ask how likely are we to achieve this without stronger direct redistribution through taxes and transfers? Tony Atkinson, in his very important recent book, Inequality, What Can Be Done, which I would warmly recommend to you all, uh, effectively counters the notion that we're powerless and puts forward an impressive menu of policy responses, ranging from innovations in labor market institutions to seeking to direct, to the extent that we can, technological change, and to bring about a broader ownership of wealth. But he also, specifically in the UK context, it has to be said, uh, includes in his set of proposals a strongly redistributive set of changes to the tax and social protection system. National contexts differ. The UK has some distinctive aspects. But it's difficult to see a strategy to tackle increasing inequalities and reverse them being effective without including such a strong redistributive direct component. So I hope this is enough to stimulate debate and look forward to hearing the discussion. Thank you. And now um, we have a, uh, <coughs> another initial contribution from Andre Stuschlich, who is a policy analyst with the European Parliament. Uh, over to you, Andrew. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, now, this is an honor at the same time a quite challenging task to talk after Brian Nolan on inequalities. Um, while this is a library and he's uh, presented and offered you, recommended you a book by Tony Atkinson, I recommend you one book of his, um, Changing Inequalities in Rich Countries, which you've read together with uh, Bimo Salverda, and I'm quite um, grateful that one of the contributors is also here, Virginia Maestri. Um, this has been a quite uh, uh, challenging task and, and comparative analysis of rich countries, and um, I have the most of what I will say will be quite in line with Brian Nolan's findings, but I will try as well to have one or two uh, provocative nuances in what I'm going to describe. So please bear with me three parts of, of my considerations. The first would be to... Uh, present some general con observations on, on inequality or income inequality. So this will be my main focus, although I know we have many inequalities we want to discuss today. Secondly, I will present some, some recent data specifically targeted of, or on the euro area member states. And thirdly, uh, let me spell out some, some short political economy, since I'm a political economist, um, considerations why this could matter or should matter to European policymaking. As, as fascinating and as interesting this book is, it is also quite telling that EU social policy, um, with the exception, with the notable exception of social investment package, is hardly present at all. So to start with my general observations, um, perhaps we should, well, I would suggest to first look at income as such before we turn to its relational aspects. Um, why that? I would like to link or to stress the link of income and happiness and subjective well-being. Why that? Because we can see recent work by 
uh, Daniel Kahneman, but also by Ernst Fehr, would suggest that higher income levels, gross disposable household income, is quite directly linked to a greater life satisfaction. While it is true that there is a kind of diminishing marginal effect of income on happiness, recent research would suggest that sort of what we used to call an Easterlin paradox on the fact that there would be a saturation point at some given level, this uh, has been challenged in, in recent years. So having said that, and the reason I'm telling this individual picture is that it, and this is very much in line with what Brian Nolan said, it is quite tricky to make the link of income um, and happiness or this relationship to inequality. On the other hand of this distribution, we do find that for absolute poverty levels, in a sense of material deprivation, um, it's literally bad for your health. Ernst Fehr and Johannes um, Haushofer recently wrote in a science paper on, on increased levels of cortisol in people who experienced and suffered and endured um, shocks of um, material deprivation. So I think it's, it's what I just said, it's tricky to link this in the income happiness relationship to income inequality. And this uh, Gini project by Professor Zaveda and Brian Nolan um, and others has convincingly shown that increasingly unequal societies they are not automatically worsening in terms of social outcomes. So this is by no means an argument for complacency, um, but it simply suggests that there is no absolute level of societal preferences on inequality. It's rather, as political scientists coined it, embedded in routines and, and norms of national welfare systems. I think one of the very, among the very many um, interesting findings in this book is that as persistent as these relative inequality preferences <coughs> appear to be, there is observable change in the long term, yet it's rather episodic than linear and varies, as he just explained, significantly across member states. Um, speaking of, of, of time and, and, and linear development, the Commission President, uh, in his State of the Union speech, also, and I think correctly, pointed at the temporal aspect of the trend of rising in inequalities. But then again, it would be interesting to rising between whom? I mean, rising inequality within member states need not to automatically trigger EU-wide concern across countries. You may have better performing countries, which will then compensate and flatten the average. Um, besides, I think this is one of the many reasons why, for instance, the Social Protection Committee is not very keen on using composite indices and rather promotes, uh, very much promotes the use of dashboard indicators. But time matters also in another way. The true impact of today's high share of long-term unemployed and those not in employment or education or training will affect inequality levels more heavily in the future. Social indicators, as well, you know much better than I do, usually react with some time lag on a worsening social situation. Quite new in this debate, I think, is the relationship to growth aspects. So the OCD estimated recently that the rise in inequality between 1985 and 2005 came at the cost of 4.7 percentage points in cumulative growth in the five years later on, so in the period between 1990 and 2010. So it may appear that inequality is costly, in fact. And this would be, bring me to my um, third short general observation, which is about measurement. <clears throat> It might be quite, or might sound quite commonsensical, but uh, environmental factors, of course, do matter when it comes to perception. Rising inequality will be perceived completely differently in times of prosperity and in times of economic growth rather than during a recession. If you look at Germany's experience of the last years, inequality increased substantially until 2010, but it hardly translated into any kind of political opposition because it has at the same time witnessed reduced unemployment rates since 2006. So kind of a pull and push development here. Um, just in terms of research design, I think uh, this has also been mentioned by this top 1% against 99% debate. Um, wealth has been... Uh, because of the lack of data and reliable data, um, not been very present in, in income inequality research, while I think it does matter. Just another example from 
Germany, if you allow, since I am German, during the next decade, so in the 10 years until 2024, households will or may expect to inherit from the now retiring generation an amount of approximately 2.1 trillion euro. Now, this is not the interesting figure. The interesting figure is that out of which the top 2% of households will inherit 1.4 trillion. So it's a quite, a, quite a stark concentration of, um, of wealth here. I'd like to come to some, some data, sort of my, my second major point, uh, in income inequality in the euro area since the financial crisis. Um, to some extent, uh, Brian covered this already. Um, just, again, two examples, perhaps the UK and, and Germany again. If you, if, you link, if you look at Thomas Piketty's top income database, and if you just look at the, the bottom 90% of the vast majority of um, and you find that um, in the United Kingdom, the bottom 90% had more or less the same income in 2012 as it had in 2000. So more or less a decade without any improvement in purchasing power. In Germany, it's even worse. Um, here you could see that in 2008, so even prior to the crisis, Germany's bottom 90% had even a lower income, real income than in 1992 figures. I think this also, of course, relates to our debate of today, why it, why it matters, these, these trends, and as much variety as there is, um, it's particularly troubling that it's the lower end of the distribution which has been affected most. Between 2007 and 2011, the average income of the bottom 10% in Spain, Greece, Estonia, and Ireland fell by 5% or more, but per year. So it's... Uh, to some Westerners and to some rich it's quite unimaginable to what extent um, these income groups have been affected. On top of that, to make things worse, we do perceive, and this is already very much uh, and to extent corroborated by the spoken by this data here, um, a growing divide, divide within the euro area. The European Parliament published at the beginning of this year an extensive study on uh, not only income inequality, but also they disentangle data and to distinguish between wages and wage and income inequality. And I will not um, re refer to all the details here, but um, it's interesting that those countries do not fall in line. It's only two, now only five countries where deterioration happened on both indicators, which means that on wages counted as gross annual wages as well as income. It's uh, Spain, France, Slovenia, Cyprus, and Austria. And as, trick, as delicate as the measurement is, is an example in Portugal and in Greece, where you can see some reduction in wage inequality. However, this might be sort of camouflaged by increased level of unemployment, which on the short term may, um, may help to reduce these figures. Um, to cut it short, a final final remark on the political economy relevance because um, on the one hand you do have a concern of the EU specifically the EMU on wage developments when it comes to nominal wage costs in remit in the realm of the macroeconomic imbalance procedure but not in the social sector. Now you could make the point that a rise in income inequality within and between the member states not does not automatically increase this inequality in social outcomes. I mean, that would be a fair point. So you could say, well, why bother? Um, I think you have to care because you have a kind of an expectation management problem. And this will be my final remark. Um, with the union on the one hand setting its own targets in social inclusion and member states at the same time having little competence delegated. I mean, this is well known, of course. But conversely, the member states face the problem that they do hold responsibility to, for provision of social inclusion, but at the same time become, some of them, less and less in the, in the position to provide a high level of social inclusion. Hence, what I would like to convey to our discussion, perhaps, is this point that the electoral expectation to find solutions is shifted upwards in crisis countries and becomes 
on the other hand, more EU skeptical in the thriving ones. So in this respect, the growing divergence of social policy expectations appears to be a growing challenge. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the discussion. About three quarters of an hour for further contributions and discussion. And in a moment, I would ask you to indicate if you would like to um, raise your hand, if you'd like to contribute or ask a question of uh, Brown or Andre. Um, if, when you do speak, will you please introduce yourself, at least as far as saying which institution you come from or which country you come from, uh, so that we have um, some background to your comments. But who would like to begin? Duncan Galley from the University of Oxford. <coughs> yes, from the University of Oxford, UK. Okay. Um, I, I think a lot of the focus uh, recently has been on trends in inequalities. But I'd like to put on the agenda the need also to get a better understanding of the mechanisms that lock people into particular positions in the structure of inequality. And I think if there was a lot of fluidity, we wouldn't be that much worried. I mean, the problem is that people get trapped into um, positions of disadvantage which last for a very long period of time. And there has, of course, been a lot of work on that, and that's focused on primarily on the family, the role of the family in education systems. But I suspect we need to extend that agenda, and in particular to look at the, the quality of jobs and the way in which jobs are organized, because more and more of the learning which could make improvement possible has to occur within people's careers now. As technology change occurs more rapidly, um, as people's lives at work go on for longer, the learning experience at work will become more and more crucial to people's ability to escape from disadvantage and to improve their positions. And what we know is that there are huge differences between occupations in many of the factors which make possible learning at work. I mean, whether you're talking about employer training, whether you're talking about people, the job control that people have and therefore their ability to learn on the job through experience, or whether you're talking about job security, because that too affects whether employers will invest in training. And in a sense, there's a, there's a good side to the story, which is that there are very big differences between European countries, and in particular, the Nordic countries, I think, have shown that you can really make some sort of progress on that. I mean, if, you, if you look at the position of the low-skilled in the Nordic countries and compare with other regions in Europe, you can see that policy initiatives have had really a very big effect. I mean, if you take the European Social Survey, 42% of the low-skilled in Nordic countries have had training over the last year. If you take the southern countries, it's 9%. If you take the proportion with jobs where people can really take decisions at work, you have 49% of the low-skilled in the Nordic countries in such jobs. And it's only 23% in the East European countries. So policy can make a difference um, and indeed, Europe seemed to understand that at one stage with the Lisbon strategy, because the Lisbon strategy said we should create not only more jobs, but better jobs. But if you actually look at what's happened over the last 10 years, there's no evidence really for an improvement. So I think this needs to be, a, you know, any attack on the structure of inequality needs to start looking at policy initiatives whereby we can improve the quality of jobs, particularly of the low skilled, and give people more opportunity in their lives. comment of the last uh, speaker, but uh, in order to have policy initiatives, we have to envisage of what will be the model for Europe, of what kind of social model we want to, to talk about. We are here for a short seminar at the European Parliamentary Research Service, and the aim of, the, of this short seminar should be how, how we want to envisage uh, such a social model in comparison and in relation to an economic model, and this is what is actually lacking for the time being. And especially if we talk about inequalities, it's very nice to talk uh, fragmented policies about the UK, about Germany,
Germany, Greece, etc. But we also have to speak about what are the drivers for these inequalities and how this relates to different trends. Because we cannot speak about policies if we don't uh, take, first of all, the political, uh, social and economic climate environment and at the same time also the stakeholders involved, which are trade unions, which are the persons concerned, people employed or unemployed, women, men, uh, etc. So um, I would like to suggest that in order to live with a nice feeling from, from this seminar, we need to actually check of what kind of model Europe wants to get. Thank you. Anton Heemreich, University of Amsterdam, London School of, uh, of Economics. Um, Brian, you, you didn't really uh, provoke me, um, but, but I'd like to pick up on one thing, uh, and I think I totally agree with you, uh, you know, when you said in your last comments that uh, you know, if, you want, if we want to do something about inequalities, we have to bring in a distributive solution, whether it's raising taxes or raising benefits or, or what have you. And, uh, and I'm not going to talk about the political support base for that, but, 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 but I really think that, you know, looking at rising trends of, of inequality and then stopping with a tax increase is just not good enough uh, for, for all the reasons that Duncan uh, put on the table because the life course with, with and without jobs has changed so dramatically. So I really think we need to think in terms of a life course perspective and then exactly you can show that, you know, if there is good early childhood education and care, you probably have a higher PISA scores in your education system. A higher PISA score in your education system correlates with higher levels of employment at higher levels of productivity, which means higher levels of taxation, also with lifelong learning with a later exit age. And that sort of creates a kind of a multiplier effect that, that your buffer for social protection could be well enhanced in a way that, you know, we cannot go back to the, to the good uh, uh, 1950s where we had a totally different kind of industrial and family model. So I think, you know, the tax, the distributive story that you, you, you vouch for, I think is well understood, although I think it's very difficult to get it politically across. But it's, it's really thinking about these life course multipliers and for which we have really good data that actually we can, we can achieve much more. And then with respect, you are, you are a bit dismissive um, of the OECD in terms of that they today say, uh, you know, inequality, inequality is really bad for the economy. Um, I mean, I think the OECD has learned um, uh, uh, massively f uh, over the past uh, uh, decade because, you know, in the mid-1990s, the OECD job study uh, basically said you have to retrench, you have to deregulate bargaining, and so on and so forth, and we now know the results. So I'm happy uh, that uh, the OECD is with us uh, in this respect. And as Andre put uh, 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 down with respect to the to the program uh, countries, if you read the letters of the European Central Bank to you know, countries like Italy and Spain, you know, forget about Greece, it's exactly the 1996 job study which will massively increase inequality in countries that are already highly unequal. So this whole thinking of, uh, uh, in terms of social policy, in terms of a life course and the multiplier effects that are important it's just wasted. Only very briefly, I, I, I agree with everything that Anton has said. Of course, redistribution can only be part of the strategy. What, what I was simply saying is it needs to be part of the strategy. It's not the strategy. And I guess I, I, I would also very much welcome the... the, the very profound shift in orientation that you see in, for example, the OECD and the IMF, uh, for that matter as well, uh, where inclusive growth uh, is seen as the goal and inequality is seen as, uh, as, as an obstacle. What, what, I, what I suppose I was trying to caution against is, is the notion that this, that this gives us some comfortable, easy answers where it's, uh, it, it's a, a positive sum game and everybody can benefit. Tackling inequality is still about redistributive struggle. Uh, and I'm sure that it's not only about that, 
Mm. But it's a, it is about that. Yes, uh, Dominique Schoer from University of Lausanne, Switzerland. Just in the line of what has been said in the debate, I think uh, two or three points are interesting to underline. First, for the development of education. If you look in the case of Switzerland, it's more or less the case for many countries. In the last 20 years, there was immense growth of the education and the level of education and so on, and the rotation between the change in the vocational training and the way to continue. But if you just compute the inequalities in terms of reproduction from one generation to the other, more or less it's the same. Just could be a little bit more, a little bit less, doesn't matter. More or less it's the same. So that means that you can have very strong differentiation in the system, and even you can have perpetuation of inequalities. And second point, the same line, I think, which is important to keep in mind too. In the case of Switzerland, and the case of many countries too, now the education level for the women is higher than the one of the men. But when you are on the, 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 the working market and the situation, of course, that's the reverse still. And this kind of education is still, the, uh, of inequality in education between genders is still very strong. So that means that we have a two sides of the coins. On one side, we have to put a lot of measures which are efficient, which are important, and so on. And at the same time, we can have reproduction of very important inequalities. And so we must learn a little bit more how to play with this, with this uh, intersectionality, for example, on this kind of thing. Yes, Bea Cantillon from the University of Antwerp. Um, well, I would like to say uh, two things. First of all, I, I fully agree with um, Brian Nolan's um, uh, focus on, 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 on the need for social redistribution, although, uh, Anton, of course, you are right, we need also social investment. But um, only talking about social investment as the EU did in, in the past, that is definitely not enough. And this is... Uh, this comes, becomes very clear if, if you read the book of uh, Tony Atkinson, and really I, I, I encourage all of you um, to read that book. It's a very important book um, because in that book um, the author names a cat a cat, and that is that if you want to reduce um, inequalities, if you want to reduce poverty, uh, you need um, important redistributive programs. That, but this is one point that I would like to oh, like to, to stress. The other one um, is about pan-European, and this is your question, about pan-European inequalities. Um, because we are looking at, and, and the kind of research we are all involved in, uh, we are mainly um, <clears throat> looking at inequalities within countries. And we are comparing countries. Uh, um, in Europe, we are comparing small countries, uh, Sweden with Denmark, and Denmark with Belgium, and Belgium with Luxembourg. Um, that's the kind of business that we are in. Um, and then the conclusion is, as you said, Brian, um, inequalities in, in Europe are, um, are smaller than, than in the U.S., but we are comparing very small welfare states, homogeneous welfare states, with the big welfare state um, <coughs> Uh, the U.S. Um, if we take another perspective, um, if we, 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 we take the Gini coefficient or the, the at-risk of poverty uh, threshold um, defined at the EU level, EU-wide level, and we make the kind of calculations that the U.S. do, um, taking the Gini coefficient for all the Americans, um, then um, we see that the inequalities in, in, in the EU are more or less the same as in the US. Obviously, inequalities within the countries, within most of the countries, is, are less um, than in, 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 in the US as a whole, but because of the big differences and, and so the, the big inequalities between countries, between the rich countries and the poor countries, um, uh, at the end, uh, the inequality between the Europeans taken as a whole um, is higher than the inequality, or at least as high as the inequality between the Americans taken uh, as a whole. Um, 
And what is very worrying that is that the, these, the, the, the European EU-wide inequalities are increasing, um, mostly because of, of the, 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 the southern European countries where um, the inequalities are rising and where the, 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 the GDPs are um, are increasing very slowly. So the increasing inequalities within within the EU, I think that this is really a challenge uh, and that we should start to think about uh, which kind of pan-European policies should we or could we um, get in place. And, and that is something that is missing in, in and remains largely, and you also point to that, um, remains largely missing in, in, in the debates that uh, we have, and I think that we should put this uh, firmly on the table. Yeah, just, just quickly, um, I, I totally agree, and at the same time, it's given the treaty allocation or the allocation of competences as it is, which I will not bore you with, it's at the same time understandable that there's no progress. And if you think, if you look at the procedure, how the General Secretariat, and this is no you know, blame shifting to the Commission, but how the General Secretariat is producing the country-specific recommendations and how ECFIN is in the lead and how DG employment then adds on notions of poverty reduction and how difficult it is to get these notions incorporated in the chaperone communication. Um, it is just the mirror image of how the competences are. Um, it's quite understandable that we see so little progress. I mean, there has been, um, if you remember, one of uh, Jean-Claude Juncker's speeches to uh, introduce a kind of a triple social A. Uh, Tita Boeri, whom you possibly know, um, were calling for a social stress test. Um, these are all very nice um, notions and, and initiatives, but uh, I do not see too much progress in that. A final short remark regarding redistribution, the, um, the huge study by the European Parliament, which I was referring to earlier, um, said that uh, they have kind of evidence to see that in countries where you have a minimum wage, this indeed worked as a kind of a lower platform and, and shielded off um, some of the lowest um, of, well, households with the lowest incomes. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. I'm Bruno Cosin from the University um, of Lille in France. Well, um, I'm of course very interested in the um, in the debate, and it's it's kind of str a, a little strange for me because you know I'm I'm like I basically study basically the, the upper class, the wealthy, and in the way in which basically we speak here about redistribution, on which I think. Almost everybody here, here agree that it's one of the solution to fight against inequality. There is also always this impression that we speak about it in this sort of like Rawlsian way, you know, in like trying to redistribute just to uh, increase uh, the life level, you know, of the poor, which is of course one of the goal. However, you know, it's like trying to, <laughs> I mean, inequality, it's a spread increasing in part. And I think redistribution cannot just try to, like, in effect, like, you know, slow the machine and slow the increasing of the spread by just trying to help the ones that are basically at the bottom of the social ladder. I mean, you have to face it. You need to impede the one at the top to stop accumulate as quick as they're doing it right now. Because, and to do that, I think probably there is, a, I mean, and I think there is policy that probably could seem a little radical, but that could like be discussed and uh, that could achieve this goal. I mean, to just quote a, a couple of them, to make a couple of examples. For example, this place, the European Parliament and uh, the European project was also about like, uh, you know, uh, creating Europe as a country, internationalizing more uh, the people, and for sure, that's a goal that has been achieved uh, like even more for the top of the social ladder. You have work like uh, the work of Adrian Favel that shows how people circulate in Europe, and so we have people that are more and more international, more and more multi-territorial, and uh, those has basically two main effects. There is the fact that they're more multi-territorial, they can have assets in several countries, and they also, there is also a, sh a 
shift in the reference group. There are people that, you know, like try to establish and to understand what's their social level comparing, comparing it with people in other country. So basically, if inequality increases in one country, they may tr want to be you know, like the people at the top in other countries because the re reference group is international. So because there is multi-territoriality, it means that uh, maybe one um, of, the, of the main policy we should really be thinking about is how, how to have like serious multi-territorial and multinational like income, income tax and tax on wealth. I mean, a couple of, I mean, six months ago, we were in a, in a, in a seminar with Paul Krugman, and he, he said as a joke, if even only New York and London will be coordinating on their ta local tax policy, it will be great, you know? And uh, so, and maybe there is this idea also to try to, like, um, raise taxes on income across Europe, at least, and maybe even across the world on the assets and property of, like, uh, European citizens. The second thing also is that, a lot of our colleagues referred or directly spoke about like uh, uh, the work of Thomas Piketty, and uh, it's nice how the first part of his book is always uh, discussed. Everybody agree on it, but there is, as you know, I, know, I know, I know the book is very big, but there is like the last third is about basically his policy advices, and uh, one of the issues that Thomas uh, that Thomas Piketty raised a lot, and that is also raised more directly by one of his. Uh, is uh, the people, one of the persons who work with him that is called Gabriel Zuckman that just published a book called The Hidden Wealth of, Nation, mm -hmm. the, the Eden, the Eden Wealth of, Na of Nations, is the fact that, of course, uh, one of the big uh, fuel of, of this engine of uh, the spread in inequality is the fact that there is, uh, that redistribution exists, but often redistribution doesn't apply to uh, everything that should be redistributed because you have people that do tax optimization, you know? And so the, one of the, the characteristics of uh, uh, the wealthy is that they have professionals that tell them pay less taxes. Some of us, some of you have it too, probably. And uh, uh, the, the issue with that uh, is the fact that uh, what, for example, the work of Gabriel Zuckman shows is that uh, one of the things that blocks uh, in the European context is, for example, uh, the central role in the, in the building of the European uh, Union, for example, the central role of Luxembourg, which is both one of the core, and, and it's, it's one of the country that is very strategically, strategically embedded in all European institutions, and it's also one of the main uh, piece of the fiscal optimization mechanism. So, I will not say like Thomas Piketty that often joking, but he jokes a lot about that. He's saying we have to obligate Luxembourg to stop doing a certain number of things. Well, of course, coercion cannot be the way, but maybe uh, a way, a, a real political way should be found to do that. You know, one of the difference, for example, between Switzerland and Luxembourg is that the fact that the financial industry is now, and the financial industry related with uh, bank secrecy is re representing almost 2 to 3 percent of the GDP of Switzerland, which means that basically, since they have a lot of problem with that, the Swiss are basically now considering that all the problems related with that are too much a big asset compared to the advantage, and they're just basically like, like trying to have time to uh, redirect and re-transform their financial industry to do something else. The case of Luxembourg is much more complicated because the estimate is that 40% of their GDP is related with uh, uh, bank secrecy. So maybe one of the solutions could be to find like a long-term agreement to, to compensate, in fact, Luxembourg in the long term of what uh, a shift in uh, and the obligation to stop with this activity could be. So it, it, it may be that we need to find a way to organize the, basically the end of the Luxembourgish like, uh, financial system as it exists today. And of course, we cannot deprive them of 40% of their GDP uh, next year. So we need to compensate that progressively. And maybe this is a thing that should be uh, managed at the, Euro at the European level, because it's easier maybe to compensate like the Luxembourgish population, which is less than 1% of the European population, uh, if that, you know, raising tax in, uh, across Europe to do it, but on the long term, it may be a great solution. And finally, just 
last 20 seconds, because I'm sorry, I've spoken already a long time. Uh, also, I think uh, that it's also related with um, the territoriality of inequality. There is the aspect that there is multi-territorial inequality related with like uh, globalization. But there is also the fact, and I think this is also a dimension, that there is also territorial inequality inside, uh, uh, inside countries, of course, uh, and those territorial inequality are often related with, in fact, uh, the difference in, in public infrastructure uh, across a country. And one of the problems of uh, having uh, uh, the state that are less and less uh, prosperous and the action of the states that diminish more and more is the fact that uh, uh, it generally causes an increase, as a lot of you know, in this... Um, in uh, the investment in infrastructure and therefore uh, growth in territorial inequality. I'm sorry it was too long. I, I don't have the experience that you have in this kind of like place. And therefore, I like Thank you. Um, yes, let's try and keep the contributions a bit shorter, please. Um, yes, Virginia. Just going back to some of the points already raised uh, on social investment and redistribution. So, of course, I mean social investment and social expenditure are able to reduce inequality and create a visual circle much more than uh, taxation. But however, how Andre say, I mean, looking at the current uh, policies at the European level, like the country-specific recommendation, we have to pay particular attention to some tax reforms that are suggested to member states. Uh, for instance, they shift to um, labor, from labor to consumption taxes. This is something that clearly is shifting the burden of the financing of social protection. And um, another issue is that it's creating uh, a trend of inequality which is, which is not captured by standard measures. So the increase in VAT, the cutting in kind benefits, um, reforms in pension system. So all these are reforms that are uh, not captured by the standard Gini because it's not in the income we normally uh, use. So this is an issue to be taken into account. The second point I wanted to make is about income and wealth inequality. So we talk about income or wealth inequality, but uh, it's not straightforward, the link between the two. So what are we uh, talking about, what we want to address? So we have member states with very high, uh, relatively high level of wealth inequality and low level of income inequality like Sweden, or on the other side, countries with high income inequality and low wealth inequality like Italy and uh, Greece. So this is, I think... It, this have a further reflection. And the last point is um, the role of debt that indeed uh, complicate a lot the study of wealth inequality of the last decades because, uh, I, I mean, if you look at the picture of the last uh, uh, decades, you see an increase uh, in income inequality and an increasing gap with consumption inequality. So consumption inequality did increase while income inequality were increasing. Uh, so the, this, I think, uh, deserves further attention at policy level. And at the moment, for instance, what we see, the, the attention that is mostly at the European level uh, for, wealth, for wealth is the taxation of property, which was actually the only component of wealth which had an equalizing uh, effect in the last uh, decades. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is it working? Yes. Uh, my name is Etienne Basso, and I'm the director of the Members Research Service. <clears throat> um, when we speak about uh, inequalities, we tend to focus on the two extreme ends, the poor and the, and the rich. And I wanted to, to have your views on, on the situation of the middle class and the evolution of the middle class. I know there is some controversy, whether it's shrinking, um, how it is evolving also between the different member states, because the middle class are, in a way, um, essential uh, for the European project and the cohesion of the societies. And I would be interested to have, uh, to have some, some comments uh, on this on your side. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll start us off on that. I'm sure others will have something to say as well. I, this obviously, this, this notion of the squeezed middle or the shrinking middle has been quite prominent in research and indeed in, in political debate in a number of countries. The, 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 the first problem, of course, is that we don't know what we mean by the middle. And when we talk about the middle class, we're talking about people who are in probably the top one-third of the income distribution, 
not in the middle of that distribution at all. So uh, th there's a th th the first problem is that you're th that many different issues are being mi mixed up together when we talk about the squeezed middle and their political salience in particular. I guess that the research would suggest again that there's a lot of variety from from uh, across OECD countries or European Union member states in what has happened to the size of those around the, around the middle. Um, but my, my sense of it is that much of the much of the interest in the squeezed middle or in the fate of the middle class is actually not about not about the size of the group or indeed their share in total income. It's much more about what's been happening to their living standards in real terms. Are their are their living standards and their uh, incomes less secure than they used to be? Uh, are they suffering from other pressures due to, for example, the housing market, due to wealth and debt that Virginia mentioned? Um, so I think I think we're not going to capture, we're not going to be able to answer your question by focusing narrowly on the income distribution and the share going to the middle or the share in the middle. It's a, it's a very much more nuanced picture than that. And, and the concerns are as much about living standards, insecurity, precarity, debt, uh, and, and indeed whether the middle class can secure, as they have in the past, uh, the... the advantages that they have enjoyed, whether they can secure them for their children. And th those are the aspects that feature in this debate rather than simply uh, a sort of a, a narrow technical measure of whether the, the income distribution is becoming more polarized. Yes, I, mean, I think as Brian said, a great deal depends on how we conceive of the middle class. And what is interesting is if you use different occupational classification systems, you actually see rather different patterns. So, I mean, you can take the British data, and there are three major mm -hmm. occupational classification systems, and they show different patterns. Um, and a lot of that relates to how women's work is classified. Because in many classifications, women's work is at the bottom. So that does, you know, it's been expanding and doesn't shrink, and gives you this impression of the sort of hourglass um, sort of effect. But it's... Um, if women's occupations are regarded as more skilled and they're often put in the, uh, in the classification systems, then, of course, they move up into the middle. And in that case, the shrinkage is relatively, uh, is relatively low. So I think all we can really say is there have been particular middle class or middle, middle occupations which have really shrunk across most societies. Skilled manual work, for instance, especially male skilled manual work has, has shrunk, and female clerical work has shrunk. But there's no, been no general um, decline in middle-class occupations, if you start saying that you know, people who are doing service work, um, people who look after the old elderly are actually doing quite relatively skilled work and are not to be classified as low-skilled. And the only other thing I would add is that Michael Tarlin did an interesting study of this issue, and he suggested that insofar as there was shrinkage, um, it was much less in countries which generally had egalitarian social policies. So uh, we could discuss the reasons for that. But this came as a rather clear pattern in, in this data. Thank you, Jukka Kekkonen, Helsinki, Finland, University of Helsinki. I have just one point, actually. I, I could say very much to, as a comment to, to other very good good uh, speeches, but uh, just a small comment. I think it's important that we, we need a kind of a long-term analysis in all these, all these fields that are tackling these problems of inequality. And I'm a legal historian, and uh, I would say that uh, studying causes and effects of growing inequality is very important. And from my professional experience, I can say that growing inequality or growing divide between the rich and the poor has always led to tightening social control, more harsh punishments, and so on. And this could be even seen in the present day development if we are looking at prison populations, for example. And then my last comment goes to, goes to the middle class. I think that uh, one of the really fundamental issues is the situation of the middle class in all industrialized countries, because there is no democracy if there is no middle class. Uh, John Bell, likewise a, a lawyer. I hope 
that doesn't mean too many of us are involved. Um, much of the discussion's been about, as it were, economic um, and wealth in inequalities, but the, there are other inequalities that we often value um, to, to, to tackle because participation in society is an important sort of individual aspect. And so when one thinks of, of disability and, uh, and so on. As a, as a lawyer looking at the practical side, I'm interested to see what others think are the requirements that would come out. Um, I would identify in the sorts of legislation that we have three different types of intervention other than taxation that people have talked about. The first is simply a duty to take into account inequality when you're making a policy. In other words, it's a question in the impact assessment. Secondly, there might be a negative duty. That is a duty not to make things worse. And we see in a number of constitutional cases, particularly on taxation in, in different countries, at constitutional courts striking down legislation which seems to make things worse for particular classes of people. But the third is a positive duty to do things about particular types of inequality. So the, in, England, in the UK, the Equality Act 2010 identifies very specific equalities, um, sex, race, and disability, and says you need to do something about those. You need to take positive steps in your plans as public authorities to do things about those things. And the question for me is, well, there are various issues being raised about things that we need to do. What exactly do we need to be doing, and how do we frame it? So I'm certainly not going to be able to answer that question. Um, Alison Woodward from the Free University of Brussels. Um, I also, some of us sound people are now coming in with our other thoughts. Um, the title of this is Inequality, so I was very happy when John Bell mentioned inequalities is not just about economic inequalities. And in Europe, of course, the front pages of our newspapers are about migration. Now, it may be because of the nature of this panel, but we have not been talking about the others who are are moving around across the borders inside this large territory and coming in from the outside. Uh, these others are with us and, and experience inequalities that are not just related to material aspects. So my first point is we haven't talked about, we've mentioned gender, I think, once or twice, uh, but actually the big elephant in the room is, is difference between people that is visible in terms of abilities and also in terms of race. And I think that this is a huge challenge for the European project, which is complicated because of the growing economic inequality. I have a lot of sympathy with my natural science colleagues and climate change, okay? Science knows that climate change is being caused by human behavior. And yet politics and policymakers across Europe and across the globe are in denial. Now this topic, inequalities, is also something in which politicians are in denial about. Sometimes the argument is inequalities are good because people will work harder to get to the top. So this stimulates society, this stimulates economic growth. This is being in denial. Social science research that we've been talking about here shows in every single field, inequalities make things worse for people. So psychology, self-perceptions, health, Politics, and that's where I would like to stop because that's what I think we need to talk about in the last few minutes, politics. Increased inequalities lead to political consequences for our politicians. We see a rise of different kinds of politics outside the borders of normal politics and normal consensus. At the same time, we see a lessening of participation for those who are suffering from inequalities, leading to those who have making more of the decisions and making it much harder to address this issue of growing inequality. So these top 2% are very important in decision making. And addressing inequality and the social science research that demonstrates for the last 25 years with increasing strength, this is extremely dangerous for the European project. 
This is what we have to answer. How do we get to politicians? So this theme, and now I, I look at somebody who's from the Joint Research Center. I looked today at the website. I looked today at the Joint Research Center. 3,000 people work for the Joint Research Center. The themes do not mention society except in terms of information and in terms of behavioral change. So on the website, teams at this very large internal research institute for the European Commission, 3,000 people, are not obviously working on the issue of inequality. My kudos to this service. Their website shows that migration is an issue, that there are reports being done about migration, there are reports being done about global inequalities. But the scientific input into the large agenda-setting institutions in this town is aberrantly against social science research. Horizon 2020, funding, and the representation of academic social science research towards decision makers is very low. So I hope that we can figure out some way to get what we know, just like our natural science colleagues know what needs to be done about climate change. Around this table, and certainly where we work, there are answers to this problem. There's analysis, we've already heard much of it, and there are also ways that policymakers could address it. How do we get our politicians to take this and climate change seriously? That's my question back to the panel and hopefully a little bit what some people in the audience came here to hear about. Thank you. My name is Maria Arena. I'm an MEP coming from the SND group. Um, I'm very pleased to be, the, to be here because I'm convinced that fighting against poverty is a very huge uh, challenge that we have here in the Parliament. Not only in the Parliament, I think that the Commission and the Council has a lot of things to do about that. Uh, but I can, I can tell you that the position now in the different institutions, European institutions, uh, Parliament, Commission, and Council, it is not the priority. The priority for the moment is competitiveness. And it's why we don't speak about climate change, because when you speak about climate change, you have a cost for that, uh, and so you have a problem with competitiveness. Uh, when you speak about social rights and redistribution, you speak about that, we spoke, you spoke about that, it has a cost, uh, and so it's very difficult to put this priority. And I think that for the moment, the less you pay, the best you are. Uh, I can give you an example. I'm working in the ample uh, committee, and we are just wor uh, working on uh, the posting directive, uh, posting workers. And it's a very competition in Europe. And the less you pay your workers, the best you are for the moment. And when you speak about Germany, <laughs> you are from Germany, if the wages are uh, plat uh, for the moment, it's not right. They are decreasing for a lot of people in Germany uh, because they are using people coming from other countries and not well protected. And it is not the fact that they are coming from other countries. It's just because they are not protected. Uh, and so it's very difficult for the moment to to fight for that. We, are, we, we feel very alone about that. And my question is, you are so many academics here. How is it possible to convince these political groups to work for equality in Europe? And just to say that OECD uh, is now convinced that equality is good for everything, everybody, even for economy. How is it possible to convince the European, uh, perhaps, business Europe. I think that uh, the politicians have more uh, attention uh, to the message coming from business Europe than from the academic. Uh, so, that is sure. So, perhaps we have to change something. Uh, uh, but I think it's really, really difficult for the moment. And when you say the triple A, uh, social triple A from the Commission, Okay, this is the words from the Commission, but we don't have something really uh, pragmatic about that. So 
I totally agree with you. Uh, we work with uh, you uh, to convince other parties, uh, but it's really difficult for the moment. Briefly, and then Brian, again very briefly. Oh, I, I have the solution to all of your questions. It's so easy. Um, now, um, a hypothesis. <clears throat> if Daniel Kahneman is right about prospect theory, then we are interested in relative rather than in absolute comparisons. And that would mean we are comparing our income to our neighbors. Um, for the time being, the neighbor is local, regional, or national, but hardly not pan-European. So the question, or the answer to Mr. Bell's question, is also to yours, and finally also to you, is how to make it, how to transform this academic unease with inequality into political salience so that the electorate would punish politicians for not taking action, this duty of uh, not only to not making it worse but also to improve it. Um, the salience can be only happening if we expose it. So if it make it, I don't know, this sounds like, uh, like small steps, but if you think of what PISA and the ranking and the display of its relative position did to the German economic system, uh, educational system. You can't under underestimate it. And it's by no surprise, and this is again no criticism, but the European Commission is actively sh shying away from exposing like the worst performers and the good performers. I think if we would have something of a more clear exposure of social outcomes in that sense so that people would then, the electorate would understand its relative position, start to care slowly and eventually come up with uh, the demand for some policies to tackle with that. Very briefly, I think what, what one has to try and get across it, in terms of a message is not just what has been happening in terms of trends and drivers of those trends, but in terms of the, the point that was made uh, a number of times, the, the risk that this poses to, to the politicians because of the reaction of their electorates to what they're experiencing uh, in terms of uh, precarity, stagnating living standards, but also the perception that the distribution is not fair. That it simply is unfair that so much of the benefits of growth would go towards the top, and that, as we heard about the, the tax system, and, and that, that is widely regarded as deeply unfair that, uh, that, that some can evade uh, th their, their share of the tax burden. So that, that is part of what poses a very real threat to trust and confidence in the political system. And, and that's what politicians, including at, at European level, and that's what politicians perhaps uh, could, could uh, wake, wake up to first, could be brought to. Um, <clears throat> my job is to stop you. Uh, I think it, it's clear that um, this discussion could go on uh, much longer, but I hope that what has been achieved Sorry, I'm seeming to be losing my microphone. Uh, I hope that what has been sorry, sir. what has been to now try that one. <laughs> right. <coughs> I hope that what's been achieved is to illuminate at least to touch the surface of a series of extremely complex. Um, Polit questions in political economy. I think that at the end of the discussion, we've got on to the question really of how to persuade our politicians that these are questions which need answers, problems that need solutions. Um, because I think that there is still, in many countries, uh, a complacency, a reliance on the market. Um, a belief that everything will be all right in the end, um, and Alison's analogy with climate change is probably very apposite there. I do think there is an urgency about dealing with these matters before 
we actually emulate. I know Brian said that the United States is an outlier in all this. I guess that we don't want Europe to emulate the United States, and that seems to me to be the danger, unless political action is actually taken. Still, it's not my job to, it's my job to moderate this discussion rather than to um, expose my own political beliefs. Um, but I think that beliefs are important here. As Brian, I, I was about to say, when Brian mentioned the word fairness, that that's a word that hadn't been used in the whole of the discussion that I can remember. Um, and it, it is one that seems to me to be something that we do as citizens as well as social scientists uh, need to emphasize. So thank you all very much for your contributions. Uh, thanks to the European Research, Parliamentary Research Service for hosting us. Um, I hope that some of the lessons that have been, uh, some of the, the points that have been made will feed into the work of the European Parliament and the European Commission um, and that we may see some change. If that's been, if that happens, or even if it doesn't happen, thank you all very much for your contributions. Thank you.